The Truth About Mother Goose. and tell you the truth about Mother Goose, you should know who Mother Goose really was. Now, the encyclopedia tells you that Mother Goose was an old lady from Boston named Elizabeth Burgoose, and that she used to make up the stories to tell her grandchildren. Well, don't you believe it, because Mother Goose was my grandma. And here is a portrait to prove it. This is me on my grandmother Goose's knee when I was a little duckling. And up here is my childhood companion and friend, Herman, when he was just a little bug. And anyway, here now is Herman to prove to you that Mother Goose really was my grandmother. <clears throat> Herman, who is Mother Goose? She's my grandmother. That's right. She is your grandmother. How many times must I tell you she is my grandmother? That's what I said. She's my grandmother. Oh, Herman! Do you kooky bug you? Well, anyway, here is the truth. Did you know that many of her rhymes and jingles is about real people? And they are based on actual facts and happenings? That's right. Like Little Bo Peep was first a game of hide and seek before it became the nursery rhyme. Right. Jingles like one to buckle up my shoe was used to teach kids how to count. One, two, buckle my shoe. Three, four, close the door. And some jingles was used to teach the kids the alphabet. Yes, and their ABGs, too. You've all heard of Peter Piper Factor, Pick a Peckle, Pick a Peckle, Pick a Pop. Well, anyway, that thing I did up there about the Peter Piper Factor, but you know what I mean, anyway. Drama students have always used this particular tongue twist of a vocal exercise. And I, I use it all the time. That's the reason that my speech is so immaculate and my pronunciate is so good. <laughs> oh, Herman, I'm glad you brought that up. Because Peter Piper, if recited twice in a row without a breath, <laughs> is also a surefire way to get rid of the hiccups. Watch. Peter Piper picks a peck of pickled peppers. A peck of pickled peppers Peter Piper picks. If Peter Piper picks a peck of pickled peppers, where's the peck of pickled peppers Peter Piper picks? See? It works! <laughs> All righty now. Jack be nimble, Jack be quick. Jack jumped over the candlestick. A Jack be nimble originated out of a sport called candle leaping. He who could jump the candle without putting it out, good luck would come to him. And this is how it works. Now, first, I make the wish. I wish. Okay. All right. Then somebody recites Jack be nimble. Jack be nimble. Jack be quick. Jack jump over the candle. Uh oh, I put the candle out. Now my wish will not come true. Something's burning. Somebody must be barbecuing. Hmm. Ooh, that smells so good. Roast duck. That's my favorite dish, roast duck. Roast duck! No! Well, I sure messed that tail up. Ooh. Well, here's another tale, and I don't want to spoil it. So I will let this one tell itself. What's the truth about Mother Goose? Let's clear up all the mystery. Her nursery rhymes from olden times are really part of history. What's the truth about Mother Goose? Turn these pages and you'll see. We'll get the truth, the facts for sooth. Solve this age-old mystery. Little Jack Horner sat in a corner eating his Christmas pie. He put in his thumb and pulled out a plum and said, What a good boy am I. According to the facts, the history of this little rhyme goes back to 16th century London. Jack Horner was the servant of a city official on his way to deliver a Christmas present to King Henry VIII. In those days, 
it was a custom when bringing presents to the king to stick them inside a pie. And these presents, as Jack Horner knew, were usually something of great value. <laughs> And since Jack was a bit of a knave, he stuck in his thumb and pulled out a plum, which happened to be the deed to a valuable estate. sent for a city official, he made a beeline to court expecting some special favor in return for his wonderful present. And King Henry let him have it. <laughs> and as for Jack Horner, he moved in on his stolen estate where he lived happily ever after. Unless, of course, he was haunted by a certain nursery rhyme that became popular at that time. Little Jack Horner sat in a corner eating a Christmas pie. Put in his thumb, pulled out a plum, said, what a good boy am I. Jack Horner, Jack Horner, Jack Horner. Mary, Mary, quite contrary. How does your garden grow? With silver bells and cockle shells and pretty maids all in a row. The Mary in this old rhyme was Mary Stuart, Queen of Scotland, who came from France to take over the throne of Scotland, bringing with her the gay French ways, extravagant tastes, and a love of frivolity. Such going-ons was frowned upon by the dour Scots, who believed in preserving the stern dignity of the court. And so, Mary was considered quite contrary. The silver bells referred to the decoration on her dresses, and her love of exotic foods such as cockles account for the cockle shells. And the pretty maids all in a row was her ladies in waiting. But behind this playful little rhyme lies one of the most sinister and tragic stories in all history. Four years after her arrival in Scotland, she married Lord Darnley, a selfish weakling whom Mary soon came to despise. And the beautiful queen turned her attentions to a French poet who lost his head completely when the dour Scots interfered. Then followed a romance with the court musician, but this, too, ended on a tragic note. When the anger Darnley interfered. Then came the Earl of Bothwell. And the end of Lord Darnley. And three weeks later, Mary and Bothwell was married. Now Mary was much too much contrary, so the outraged Scots rose up against her, forced her abdication, and slapped her into the island prison of Loch Leven. After a few months, Mary's irresistible charm so captivated the jailer's son that he risked his neck to help her escape. Then, in a try to get back the throne, Mary got up a pretty good-sized army that lost after a big battle. Oh, dear. Then she ran all the way to England to hide with her cousin, Queen Elizabeth. But Liz became jealous of Mary because she was so popular, this girl. This dazzling cutie became the darling of the court and a rival for the crown. So Liz figured she just gotta go. Though Mary was warned of the danger, she was still contrary and went her merry way. And this was her big mistake. Because she was accused and condemned as a traitor to the government. But Mary refused to plead for mercy and stayed quite contrary 
Aventura End. Mary, Mary, quite contrary, how does your garden grow? With silver bells and cockle shells and pretty maids all in a row. London Bridge is falling down, falling down, falling down. Do you remember when you used to play London Bridges? No, 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 not bridges, the kind you wear bridges. I mean real bridges that you drive over. London Bridge. Well, here is the truth about this jingle. London Bridge is falling down, falling down, falling down. London Bridge is falling down, my fair lady. The history behind this famous nursery song is the story of Old London Bridge. A story which begins in 1176 when it was decided to build a permanent bridge of stone to unite North and South London. The bridge was finished in 1209. It was sanctified by the addition of a beautiful two-story chapel over the middle pier. And rows of nicely designed houses was built all along the bridge, making the plain Gothic structure into a thing of such beauty that it was acclaimed one of the wonders of the world. was rented to merchants who did a big business drawing their customers from the tide of traffic that was coming and going over the bridge. The upper stories of the bridge houses was nicely furnished apartments with bay windows and rooftop balconies where residents with bay windows could enjoy the fresh air and get a good look at the spectacular view. No wonder that Hans Holbein and William Hogarth and other famous painters chose to live on London Bridge. Once a tournament was held on the bridge, and people were crowded all over the place to watch two knights prove their courage in glorious combat. London Bridge was often the scene of spectacular displays and lavish celebrations, which marked great moments in English history. While living on London Bridge was both grand and glamorous, there was times when it was equally hazardous. Now and then a cargo ship would break away from its moorings and a bow sprit would come spritzing through a window. The biggest danger to the bridge and the people on it was fire. In 1666, a fire started in a King's Bakery in Pudding Lane, which was later named Charcoal Street. At first, they didn't think much about it. 
And then suddenly a strong east wind spread the fire beyond control, and it swept across the city and onto the bridge. was the famous Great Fire of London that reduced the world's largest city to a big pile of ashes and left London Bridge a bare, blackened mess. While London was being rebuilt, so was the bridge houses, and a tide of people returned. But as the centuries passed, London Bridge began to feel its age. A lot of water had passed under the old bridge, undermining its foundation. The heat of the fires had dangerously weakened its arches, fallen arches, and heavy timbers braced the tottering houses. Violent tremors ran throughout the whole structure. The once magnificent bridge, which had been the pride of London and proclaimed as one of the wonders of the world, was declared a public nuisance and was ridiculed in rhyme and in song. <laughs> Finally, on July 4th, 1823, the death warrant of the old bridge was signed and it was demolished. And a new bridge was built in its place. The London Bridge, which stands today. But the original London Bridge still lives on in the famous old nursery song. London Bridge is falling down, falling down, falling down. London Bridge is falling down, my fair lady. Shake and quake, oh London Bridge. Have a ball till your arches fall. Jump and jive, oh London Bridge, my fair lady. And that's the truth about Mother Goose. The whole truth? The absolute historical truth? Well, well as far as we know, that's the truth about Mother Goose. Now you saw the mystery. That's all we know. That's all the show. We'll close our book of history. Now, fairy tales are not like Mother Goose rhymes that are based on facts and real people. Fairy tales are fantasy. They are fun to read. I read them myself every night. But nobody really believes them. I believe them. <laughs> oh, Herman. <laughs> He's so funny. Big joke. Ooh. Anyway, fairy tales are full of imaginary characters who are loaded with magical powers. Like Cinderella's fairy godmother. Now, she could change a pumpkin into a coach or mice into horses and anything else into... Anything else? I believe it. <clears throat> then there's Pinocchio's good fairy. With a wave of a stick, she changed him from a wooden puppet into a genuine, real live boy. I believe it. And then there are bad fairies, like the one in Sleeping Beauty, who turned herself into a fire-breathing dragon. I believe it. Then you're always sure to find a wicked queen like the one in Snow White. She drank some of her own black magic and turned herself into uh, an awful mess. <laughs> oh boy, is that hard to swallow. But I believe it anyway. 
Herman, I could smash you. I believe that. Ooh, ich. In fairy tales, you will find all kinds of giants. There is small giant and the big economy size giant, like the one in Jack and the Beanstalk. That's a real big giant. It's really an old fairy tale, Jack and the Beanstalk, you know. African Zulus used to tell it, uh, American Indians told it, and everybody practically who told this tale gave it different characters. But no matter who told it, it was always the same story, and they all used the same magic beans. And this beans is the same ones I am going to imagine in the story I am going to dream up. Once upon a long time ago, there was... That's right, a giant. As big as... Herman! You feeling better, Herman? Uh-huh. I'm hungry. Hungry? Oh, but that's a very good sign. Here, have a cherry. Anyway, this giant was so big, he could squish a man just like you could squish a bug. Um, uh, Herman! It... Oh, whew, there you are. Oh, boy. For a minute, I thought I squished my best friend. Anyway, this giant was really a big hunk of a lunk, and he looked something like this. Ken Valley Happy. And the people lived happily ever after, except little Herman. Herman. Herman, what's all the sniffling is going on with you? I liked Willie. And he got killed dead. Oh, <laughs> isn't he cute? Herman, bless your little heart. Herman, there never was the willy at all. No? No, of course not. Like all fairy tale characters, willy is just a banana num. A banana, he's made up in your subconscious mind. Yes? Yes, in other words, just a figment of your imagination. No. Has anybody seen anything of a teensy, weensy little mouse? What do you mean, a little mouse? Would you put the roof back on the house and go away? I'm talking to my fre... fre... I'm... To I... No, I... Wee-wee! <laughs> Wee-wee! It's a wee-wee! <laughs> Of his imagination. <laughs> 